So Dr. V. Mohan, we all know him. Needs no introduction, but there is a lot when we read it. He's a renowned person in the field of diabetes care and research. He holds several prestigious positions and having a profound impact on diabetes management globally. As Purvi mentioned, he's the first person to be awarded that Kelly West oration outside US. He serves as the chairman of Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Speciality Center in Chennai, which is recognized as an IDF care of excellence in diabetes care. He's also the chairman of Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, an ICMR center for advanced research in diabetes, and the largest standalone diabetes research center in Asia. Dr. V. Mohan oversees a comprehensive network of more than 50 diabetes centers across India, and he serves the vast majority of population. Collective registry almost reaches 7 lakh registered patients, practicing evidence-based medicine and epidemiologically what data you have to keep, he guides us all. So Dr. Mohan's research interests are diverse. Of course, everyone knows he is the lord and king of all aspects of metabolic medicine, but his special area of interest is epidemiology of diabetes, genomic of diabetes, including the previous speaker was mentioning about how genomics are made easy and affordable and available to all the Indians only because of SIRS initiative. Precision diabetes and nutrition in diabetes. Research contribution. He has a dedication to research is evident from his prolific output. I learned from Professor Lily John also. She was mentioning how active he was even then. And then he has more than 1,700 peer-reviewed journals, publications, more than 1,000 original articles. His work has received more than 2 lakh citations. That's amazing. The Stanford University ranks him among the top 2% of scientists worldwide. And Expertscape, that is PubMed, places him among the top 0.01% of researchers in type 2 diabetes. He has many awards and honors. If I start reading out, we'll finish Disha with just the honors and accolades. And the latest has been already mentioned by Purvi Chavla. He has publications. That's very interesting. It is not just about science, but he has another ankle to him. His notable works include his autobiography, Making Excellence a Habit. Many of us have read it and received from him. And The Secret of Building a World-Class Healthcare System in India. He has shown to the world that even though we are always regarded as a developing country, what can be done in India, which matches the world, and he gets invited to give in their honors. Banting Bose and Beyond, Satya Sai Baba Lives On, which is very important, soul-searching book, which is translated into 10 languages, and another book like Eternal Divine Grace, The Miracle of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. He's a great devotee of Satya Sai Baba and a proponent of Satya Sai Baba. To summarize, very illustrious career, mentor to many of us, whether we work directly or indirectly, definitely motivates us. Groundbreaking research, extensive patient care, and influential publication. He's a distinguished leader in diabetes care and research, and we are very, very proud and honored to have you here, sir. Please come down. That is a, a memory from Mangalore. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's always difficult to talk after uh, such emotional moments. I'm extremely proud and happy that uh, Professor Lily John is here today 
it's very rare to give orations in the name of people who are there in the audience, and therefore this is a very rare honor. I've had the privilege of, as she mentioned, of knowing Professor Lily John right from her CMC days. Uh, she and her husband had been very close friends of our family, of my father. We used to meet, I think, at least for 30 or more years in various uh, API, RSSDI, and other meetings. We have learned so much from her, madam. Truly, you're an inspiration, and it's a great honor to deliver this lecture. Disha, uh, from, I've been hearing about Disha for a long time. I've been also following the great work done by the whole team. Uh, Dr. Manohar and the whole team of Disha, congratulations. I always say it's very easy to start something, but to keep it going, not many people succeed. You'll find after many, many organizations, many, many movements, the first or second year, it'll peter off and die off. But when you keep it going for a decade, it shows that you have uh, the willpower and uh, that you have so much of unity. Therefore, continue to do the great work that you're doing. I'm very happy to be here on the occasion of the first decade. I'm sure many more decades will follow. Thank you, Purvi, for the kind words, and to Dr. Anil Virmani, and to Dr. Manohar, and to all of you for the love and affection that you have shown. In fact, what I thought I'll present in this uh, uh, oration is to give you a repeat of what I spoke at uh, the Kelly West, because I know some of you were there at Orlando when I received uh, this uh, lecture and the award, but the messages are very important. The scientific messages about what you have learned about the epidemiology of diabetes in South Asians over the last 50 years is something very important, and I'm sure the majority of you may not have been there in Orlando, so I thought it's worth talking uh, that after dedicating the oration again to my good friend and senior colleague, Professor Lily John and thanking the whole Disha team, and particularly Dr. Manohar for personally inviting me for this. So this was the title of my presentation at uh, Orlando, Epidemiology of Diabetes in South Asians, what we have learned during the last 50 years. I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare. The funding for these studies, which I'm going to present to you, comes from Indian government agencies, uh, ICMR, and the Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health, Government of India, which has funded most of the studies. But we also had funding from the National Institutes of Health, NIH, uh, including the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, NHLBI, and more recently, a huge grant on, uh, from the National Institute of Aging on dementia, which we're just starting. This will be one of the largest dementia projects probably ever done in the world and we have just started that project, and also from the UK, from the National Institutes of Health Research, so all government-funded projects. So I would like to start the story in uh, 1972 for two reasons. Firstly, that was the year when I joined my father as an 18-year-old and started working on diabetes right from my first year of MBBS. But more importantly, that was the year when the first proper epidemiological study on diabetes in India was published by Professor MMS Ahuja. Professor Opi Gupta had a very similar study published the same year, so you can with very similar results. So you can include both of them uh, in that. And what that those studies showed. Now, when we say multi-center ICMR study, that was the first multi-center ICMR study done in India. But what did they do? They took six cities in India. Uh, and not all the big cities were included. Ahmedabad was, Delhi was, Trivandrum was, and a couple of other cities. And they studied only the big cities, the metropolitan cities. And in those cities, the prevalence of diabetes was 2%, 2 to 2.5%. 2.5% in Ahmedabad, the others were around 2%. And in rural India, what did they do for rural India? They took one village near each of these cities. If it's Ahmedabad, one village somewhere near Ahmedabad. It's Trivandrum, one village somewhere near Trivandrum. Only one village. 
and uh, studied the, those. And so six villages and six cities were studied. And the rural prevalence is about one to one and a half percent. So even there you can see that urban-rural divide was there in 1970s. When I joined my late father, Professor Vishwanathan, in 1972, and started working with him, of course, we were not doing epidemiological studies at that time. That came a little later, and I'll come to that. But at that time, I remember my father saying very clearly, and Professor Ahuja saying, that diabetes in India is a migrant Indian phenomenon. So what they used to say, was that we as Indians have the genes to get it, but those genes get expressed when they go abroad, when they become more affluent. Because can you imagine 1972, the Green Revolution had not yet started. We were still importing wheat from the United States. And India was living on for its food on the ships which came from the United States. So every week or so, or every two weeks, big ships will come from the United States, usually to Chennai Harbor or Mumbai. And from there, the food is distributed to the whole country. There's very little food grown in India. That is a situation 50 years ago. I remember the headlines. We have food for two more weeks. Then the next ship has to come. Only then India has food. So in that situation, when Indians started migrating abroad, they became affluent. They put on a lot of weight, and their diabetes rates went up. Where did this happen? Almost everywhere in the world, whether it's Canada, United States, UK, Tanzania, South Africa, Mauritius, Singapore, Malaysia, Fiji, wherever they went, we had, and these are different times. You can't really compare. One is in 1970s, 80s, 90s. But in India, we didn't have any other study. We had only this one study, 2%, 1%. And then Indians going abroad having 8%, 10%, 12%. So the, the dictum was, that diabetes is a migrant Indian phenomenon. When you go abroad, you'll get diabetes. If you stay in India, you don't have so much of diabetes, okay? So that is the first lesson. So I'm talking about different lessons we have learned in epidemiology over the time. The first lesson that we learned was that until the year 2000, migrant South Asians, and I'm going to use South Asia and Indians interchangeably. I've cut a little bit from the uh, Kelly West uh, lecture. So there I introduce what is South Asia. There are eight countries in South Asia, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and so on. Uh, so uh, eight countries are there. And 70%, and the population of South Asia, by the way, is about 2 billion, which is 25% of the whole world. 25% of the whole world lives in these eight countries. And of that, 70% is 1.44 billion is India. So 70% of South Asia being India, you can take India as a surrogate for South Asia. So till the year 2000, migrant South Asians had much higher prevalence of diabetes than native South Asians. Now, if you look at the published studies uh, in Fiji, Mauritius, UK, USA, Singapore, Canada, here are South Asians shown there. The majority of South Asians are Indians, by the way, but there could have been a few Pakistanis and uh, Bangladeshis in some countries, UK. But in other countries, it was mostly, in Singapore, Malaysia, it's mostly Indians who, who migrated there. Now look at the prevalence rates in each of these studies. You take Paul Zimmet's studies and look at the prevalence of diabetes in Indians in Fiji, 12%, 11%. Go across to the local population, Melanesians, 3% and 7%. There's no comparison. Indians seem to have much more diabetes compared to the local population. And that is true for every ethnic group which has been done in every study published in the world. So if you look at Mauritius, look at Chinese, Creoles, and South Asian Indians. Indians have the highest. Same thing in Paul McKee studied this in the UK. Look at the prevalence in Indians, 26%. Look at the white European, 7%. Nearly three times, four times higher prevalence, okay? And the same thing repeats in US and Singapore and Canada. Wherever you compare either with the white population, black population, Chinese population, any other population, we seem to have the highest prevalence. And done by every person, every study showing the same thing. So there's something 
which makes us get diabetes. And very honestly, if you ask me at the end of the talk, I'll try to give you the answers which we think are the reason, but we're still studying. We've still got another 40, 50, I think, before we understand why this is so. It's like an enigma. In spite of not having obesity, in spite of not having everything, we seem to have it, okay? So the second lesson that we learned is that South Asians have higher prevalence of diabetes and other ethnicities, including other Asian ethnicities. So we are having higher than the Chinese and higher than other uh, Far East and other parts of Asia. If you see, we have the highest again. So that's the second lesson that we learned. Meanwhile, we started off in 1972 when India was importing wheat, and but things started moving. The Green Revolution started in the 1970s with C. Subramaniam and M. S. Swaminathan, and India decided that we must have enough food. Today, technically, we have got more than enough food for our entire 1.44 billion. We have got so much of food we can export it. Now, is everybody getting the food properly? That's a different question. Equitability may not be the same. But we've got enough food in this country. Despite that, till 1991, India's economy wasn't very good. And it was Manmohan Singh who, as the finance minister, opened up the economy in 1991. Why did we do that? Because we are bankrupt. India is bankrupt. There's no money at all in the country. And therefore, we had to open up the economy and allow foreign. Until then, there's no Coca-Cola, there's no Pepsi here. It was not allowed. And suddenly in 1991, we realized we can't live like this. So we opened up the economy and allowed people to come in. Once it happened, there was a boom in the economy. India's economy really started growing, not now. From 1991, it has been growing astronomically. Today, we're almost the third or the fourth largest economy. We're going to soon become probably one of the largest economies in the world. After China and US, definitely India is going to become, whether we like it or not, whichever government is there, we will be the third largest economy in the world. So with this, what happens is liberalization comes in, globalization comes in, people's socioeconomic status improved, where, where we had starvation, that is replaced now with overnutrition. Still few pockets of starvation here and there, but no real starvation deaths. There's no starvation deaths in India at all. So from one end where people were dying, I have pictures of the Madras hunger, famine, where people are dying due to hunger, the Bengal famine, which was intentionally done by the British. And people died in Bengal because they could not eat. They, they just cut off the food supply and said, let them all die. You know, and that, all that happened. From there, a sudden swing to overnutrition. So with that, what happened? One of the price we paid for that is obesity and diabetes also started rising very rapidly. So if you look at this figure, it's not a perfect figure, but it still tells you a story. I've drawn a dotted line there in 1991. If you go before 1991, even in urban areas, the prevalence of diabetes is in single figures, single digits, 2%, 4%, 5%, okay? Suddenly, after 1991, see what happens. 11%, 12%, 14 16 18 22 25 Now, this 22 and 25 is from the CAR study which we did in New Delhi, uh, Nikhil Tandon, and uh, Deepa and my colleagues in, in Chennai. That's the last published study, last big study which is done is almost 10 years old now. And at that time, in the whole of Chennai, and in the whole of New Delhi, these are representative samples of the whole city. We are talking about 25% of people having diabetes. For those of you who think, oh, that means 75% did not have diabetes, there is a catch here. This is in those above 20 years of age. If you take age 50 and above in New Delhi and in Chennai in the same study, it was close to 50%. 40 to 45 percent 10 years ago. Today it must be more than 50 percent. That means one in two. If you just stand on the road in Bangalore or New Delhi or Hyderabad or Chennai, and every second person is having diabetes if they're above 50 years of age. Such a high prevalence rate has only been shown in the Pima Indians and in the Naru population, small isolated populations of a few thousand people. Only in such a race 
have 50% population having diabetes by age 50 been shown? I'll come back to that in a minute. Meanwhile, rural India was also increasing, as you can see, 2%, 6%, 12%. In the latest INDIAB study, which we did for the, of the whole country, where state by state by state, many of you in the audience may have been part of INDIAB. Today, rural prevalence of diabetes in Kerala is higher than urban. It has overtaken the urban. This is what we see in the Western world. And today in India, already it is happening. It is no longer a disease of rich people. 100 years ago, Dr. Chinilal, Chinilal Bose said that disease, it's a disease of rich people, of the nobility of India, okay, of the kings. It's a king's disease. That's what they said. Today, it's a disease of very poor people, of the poorest people in India have the highest rates of diabetes, at least in the, in the places where diabetes rates have gone up, like Chennai and other places. Poor people have more diabetes than rich people today. So it's completely changed on its head. But while all this was going on, my, uh, so, okay. So now it was time to revisit my father's statement that it is a migrant Indian phenomenon. When the rates have gone up so much in India, what is it abroad? And is it still a migrant Indian phenomenon? So in collaboration with uh, Dr. Anjali Gujral, Dr. Alka Kanaya, and Dr. Namrata Kandla, we compared the diabetes in two places in the United States, in Indians, in two places in the United States. One is in the Bay Area in California, and the other is in Chicago two places with a lot of Indians staying. So we did a representative sample of the diabetes in Chicago and in uh, the Bay Area of San Francisco, San Jose and other places where Indians live, and compared them with Chennai. Now they had only above 40 years of age. We have about 20 years of age. So for this study, we had to restrict it to those above 40 years because they didn't study anybody below 40 years of age. So if you look at in red, is the prevalence of diabetes in Indians in Chennai, and in yellow is the prevalence of diabetes in Indians in San Francisco as well as in Chicago, okay? You can see that now in Chennai, the prevalence rates of diabetes are actually higher than in the United States. So it's no longer a migrant Indian phenomenon. So what we concluded is that the clock in 40 years the clock has come full circle and diabetes rates in native urban South Asians in India are now higher than the migrant South Asians. This is a complete revelation of what was taught, what, what my father and others believed. I don't think uh, in his lifetime he would have thought that in India it will be actually higher than in the migrant Indian population. So very rapid changes in epidemiology are taking place. This was the time when my daughter came to me, Dr. Anjana, who many of you know. She was, you know, highly critical. She said, Papa, this is wrong. What you're doing is totally wrong. You're taking one city, even after that study was published. She said, it's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. You're saying that in India, it is higher than in United States, for example. But you're taking one city. You're taking Chennai, and you're taking Delhi. How can Chennai and Delhi be representative of India. It's a metropolitan city with very high rates. So don't extrapolate from there to the whole country. So I asked her, what do you want us to do? She said, we have to do the whole country. Imagine doing a representative sample of 1.44 billion people in 31 states of the country. India is more complex than the whole of Europe put together. The whole of Europe put together, if you just take Europe like that and take India and tilt it and put it there, India is actually bigger, okay, number one. Number two, our population is more than the whole of Europe put together. Number three, our culture is more different than the whole of Europe's culture put together. Number four, we have more languages than the whole of Europe put together. If you take Portuguese and Spanish and B Bulgarian and uh, French and... German and Italian and all that, you add all of them, it's nowhere near our languages. We have got more than that. So nobody has done a study of whole of Europe. It's too complicated. Nobody can do it. Nobody has even done 
a study of any country fully, United States fully, all the states, nobody has done it so far. Australia, OSDIAB study, one there, one here, one there, one picking small places, 10,000 people, 15,000 people. These are the kind of studies which are humanly possible. Are this not humanly possible to do? What she came up with was, of course, she also wanted only to do here and there a few, but when you took this idea to ICMR, to Dr. Ganguly, I was thinking he'll shoot it down, so then we'll be spared from doing the study. So I went to him and said, my daughter has this crazy idea of doing the whole country. He said, great idea, ask her to come and present. So we went and presented. When he presented, they said, done. You do the whole country. Only thing is, India, in India, health is a state subject. So if you do the study in uh, Karnataka, Andhra will not accept. Kerala will not accept. You do it in Maharashtra, uh, Gujarat will not accept. Okay? Each state is different. So they said the only, and politically there will be a lot of problem. In Lok Sabha they will ask why you chose only this state and why you left Bengal out and why you left Punjab out and there will be a lot of problem. If you want to do it, do the whole country. I was totally scared. I said, how can you do Manipa, Manipur and Nagaland and uh, you know, Mizoram and all. I don't even heard of these places in Arunachal Pradesh. Many of these places, nobody's even gone there. Okay? And we are going to do a study. People said, you won't survive. They'll kill you. In Nagaland, you go and take blood from a Naga. There's a, st there's a statement that if you draw the blood from a Naga, a non-Naga draws the blood from a Naga, they will cut your head. And we are going to do a study there, drawing blood from all the Nagas. I mean, can you imagine how frightening it was? In fact, they did that. In Manipur, they shot arrows at us. They, in in um, uh, Bombay, of all Mumbai, of all places, you got arrested. Because they said you got permission from Maharashtra, but you didn't get it from Mumbai. But you said, but Mumbai is in Maharashtra. No. Maharashtra is different, Mumbai is different. You'll have to get separate permission from Mumbai, separate permission from Maharashtra. We put in jail, actually. Our people are in jail, then we have to go and take them out, and then get another permission, and then release them from jail. Writing about this itself, how the study was done itself, a separate article was written. Lancet then wrote to us and said, I don't think such a challenging study has ever been done. So please write an article about how you did this study. So one more article we wrote in the Lancet about it. So anyway, this is my daughter's idea. So I told her, you do it. You go everywhere, every state. And to her, uh, I mean, uh, in her defense, she went to every state of this country. She went to every rural area in this country. She has been to all the 31 states. And for 15 years, I thought after one year, two years, she'll give up. It took us 15 years to complete the study. It's the world's largest epidemiological study ever done. I don't think you can do a study like this again. That's why at the end of my Kelly West, I said, if they had given me an epidemiology award, the award goes to my daughter, actually, because it's she, it's her idea, she executed the whole study, okay? And uh, this publication, uh, when it came exactly a year ago, uh, uh, June 8th, actually, June 7th, but June 8th in India, uh, when it was published last year, 2023, it became a national news, it became international news, because for the first time, not only diabetes, but pre-diabetes, hypertension, everything, we had now numbers for India. And the numbers were quite frightening. 101 million people with diabetes in India, 136 million people with pre-diabetes in India. If you add those two, 237 million, there are not too many countries in the world itself with 237 million population itself. If you leave India, China, US, probably Indonesia, after that, there are not too many countries which have 230 million people itself in the country. So if these two became a country, all the diabetic and pre-diabetic will be probably be the fifth largest country in the whole world. Only the diabetic and pre-diabetic in our country. Plus we have so much of hypertension, obesity, and so on. And the papers from India are still rolling out. Many more are going to come. This is going to be the best compendium, compendium of metabolic diseases uh, from India. Okay, but that is not the only thing that we learned from India. So many new things we learned. Just look at the age at when type 2 diabetes starts in India. If we do this in the West, the graph will be flat up to about 45, 50 years. 
then the graph will start going up. Look at where the graph is. This is for whole India. Urban, rural, of course rural is in green, much lower than urban. Male, female, not much difference. But whether it's rural, urban, male, female, the actual takeoff is at 25 to 34 years. Type 2 diabetes, virtually unknown in the West. At 25, 35 years, you don't get type 2 diabetes in the West. So this is a very startling kind of a graph. And just to put it in context, if you compare this with a study published from the UK, where they looked at the distribution, age distribution, the white population shown in purple, and in red is the South Asians and green is black. If you look at the peak, where does the peak age at onset occur in the whites? It is 60, 65 years, okay? In South Asians, in Indians, it is about 50 to 52 years. So about 10 to 15 years earlier, we seem to be getting, and the takeoff also, you can see how much earlier the takeoff occurs in the South Asians. Now, if you have stratified by BMI, we heard several times in this session itself, 80% of people have type 2 diabetes, have obesity. Several speakers uh, an hour ago were talking about obesity and type 2 diabetes. Yes, it is true. In the Western population, 80, 85% of all type 2s have obesity. And that obesity is defined by 27 and above or 30 and above BMI, not 23 and 25 as in our population. Look at where the takeoff occurs for type 2 diabetes in a population. Shown here is a BMI of 18. 18, okay? Now that is 20, that is 22, that is 23, this is 25. So probably in India, if you use 25, that will be obesity. By the time we can see how much diabetes has taken off. That means we have type 2 diabetics in India who are, have a BMI of 18, 19, 20. They are lean, they are underweight, they are malnourished, and they are having type 2 diabetes. And this is not a small number, but a huge number. So if you draw the graph there, why are all these people getting diabetes? There's no obesity at all, by any criteria. And yet they have type 2 diabetes. This is a field of intense research. And if some of you youngsters want to take up a career, I would say focus on this. For the next 20 years, it will be very rewarding for you to understand why these people are getting diabetes. Again, if you put this into context and look at uh, Naveed Sattar and Jason Gill's work. Now, this is in the UK population. Shown in red is the Pakistanis, in uh, green is the Indians, and in blue is the white European population. Again, shown BMI. Up to about 25, it is flat in the Europeans. You don't get type 2 diabetes in white European population. Look at where it's taking off in the Pakistanis and in the Indians. By 18, it's already going up. So what we're seeing in Indab is not an isolated thing. It is true. And it is also seen in the UK, despite the migration which has occurred. So there's something there about that South Asian of being thin, of being young, of being lean, and still getting type 2 diabetes. It's very fascinating, this part of it. Okay, and this is in males and females, the same thing. So lesson number four that I would like to submit to you is that type 2 diabetes in South Asians occurs at least 10 years earlier and at a much lower BMI than in white European population. So that brings us to the question, is the South Asian phenotype of type 2 diabetes different? Many people have contributed to this. I've tried to list a few. Our own work, Ramchandran's work, uh, Shashank Joshi has published on this, Yajnik, uh, Dr. Anup Mishra, and, and many others have, have put a kind of consolidated thing of what these differences are about South Asians type 2 diabetes compared to white Europeans. I already mentioned the lower age at onset of type 2 diabetes. There is also hyperinsulinemia, and I'll come back to that. In the early stages, what happens is we need to put out more insulin to keep our glucose levels normal, even if you're not obese. We have to put out much more insulin. It's like working doubly hard to keep your glucose levels normal, okay? That's what happens. So there is insulin resistance. But very soon, those beta cells tire, and then the, beta, the insulin level is going down, and you become severely insulin deficient. 
And that is what you find in those thin and young people with low BMI, severe insulin deficiency. I'll come back to that in a minute. At lower BMI, I told you that we are very thin. But if you look at the fat, if you measure the fat by any measure, CT, MRI, DEXA, any method, there's a lot of fat in the body. We are very thin, but there's a lot of fat in the body. That's what is called a thin fat Indian, which Dr. Yajnik talked about. The low birth weight and the thin fat Indian of Dr. Yajnik, I'll come back to that. We also have very low muscle mass, which explains why in the Olympic Games, at least till now, because Neeraj Chopra and all have started changing that now, and it will change because our muscle mass is improving now. But you know the game where we used to win the gold medal is where you stand absolutely still doing nothing. Archery, shooting. You sit and stand in one place and then shoot. You don't need to use your muscles at all. That's where we win the medals. Where were the Chinese winning, where were the others winning? In all others, gymnastics, in swimming, in this. Because the muscle power, we don't have the muscle power. That's why we're not winning. We're changing. In another five, ten years, we'll also have more muscle and we'll change. Probably the phenotype will also change. This is one of the most characteristic things. Did you know that we have the lowest HDL cholesterol or the good cholesterol in the whole world? The Chinese, the Japanese, the white population, or any other population, the black population, they all have higher HDL than us. If you just show HDL values, you can say who's an Indian. We're looking at the HDL. It's so low. They, we very rarely have above 40 or 50 HDL. They have very rarely below 40 or 50 HDL. So just by looking at HDL, oh, this is a white man, this is an Indian. Just by looking at HDL level. Can you imagine that? Okay. And then there are many others, okay, including low B12, which Yajnik talked about. Even the gut microbiota are different. We published two major papers in genome medicine where we looked at the gut microbiota of Indians and Danes. They are completely different. The Indian's gut microbiome is here, and the Danes are here. No comparison at all. There's no line where they even cross. So by looking at gut microbiota, you can see who's an Indian and who's a Dane, OK? Right. This was my first paper. Been working in the UK as a Welcome Trust Fellow. Nothing was known about insulin levels in Indians. Just because I had nothing else to do, I went to the UK PDS uh, database, which was there in lying in the lab in Hammersmith Hospital. And I said, let me just look. Now, there's a story to that. What happened was we had measured some insulin levels uh, from India. And I had shown very high insulin levels in our Indians. I had taken the data to UK. What I had done in my lab, working with my father, we had taken these are normal insulin levels. My boss looked at it, Dr. Eva Kona. She looked at it and said, hey, these are all wrong, yeah. Your lab is all wrong. I said, no, no, our lab is not wrong. We have got highly standardized lab. We have WHO certified. She said, how can it be? I've never seen such insulin levels. There's something wrong uh, somewhere. Then she said, you know what? Our lab has all the, our main lab in Hammersmith, the central lab, all the UK PDS data are sitting there, not published. You take out the Indians' uh, data and you take out the white Europeans' data. They have GTT, they have everything. So take it out and have a look. If what you're saying is true, that means Indians have higher insulin levels. I said, okay. So I went to the lab, got all the data out from UKPDS, and started looking at them. These are people who have normal GTT, OK? GTT is completely normal. Look at the insulin levels in the Europeans, and look at the insulin levels in the Indians. To get the GTT to be normal, Indians have to produce so much more insulin. That means they're insulin resistant, OK? And these are newly diagnosed type 2s who are entering into the UKPDS study, just diagnosed one day ago, one week ago, they had done OGTTs on them. Again, much higher insulin levels. So I showed this, I presented it at the uh, Diabetes UK meeting, just after that Diabetes UK meeting came, and Bob Turner came, the one who did the UKPDS study. He looked at it and said, Mohan, there's something terribly different about this. I have never seen this. How can one race have higher insulin level? It doesn't seem right to me. If you are right, you're on to something very big, OK? Therefore, don't stop with this. Because either you could be right or you could be wrong. If you are right, you have to do glucose clamp studies. Then you can prove that Indians are more insulin resistant. And if you prove that one race is more insulin resistant than another, this will be the first time in the world that somebody has shown it. 
please do it, he said. I said, okay, we'll do it. So we did glucose clamp studies, and that was also published uh, with my colleague Patrick Sharp and I. We actually did glucose euglycemic clamp studies. And this is the M value, the glucose uptake. The lower it is, the more insulin resistant you are. And you can see this, and these are matched, age matched, gender matched, weight matched, BMI matched. Exact same BMI, exact same waist, gender, age, everything matched. If you see that the Indians are having much greater insulin resistance compared to Europeans. To my, uh, in all humanity, I may say it's the first time in the world that we had shown that one race, just due to ethnicity, can have more insulin resistance than another. It had never been shown. Subsequently, 12 other groups have published this, at least 20 other publications from different, different parts of the world, US, Canada, UK, Paul Mickey, all of them have shown, uh, Manisha Chandalia, Nicola Abate, and uh, Mary Banerjee, and many, many others have shown the same finding, that Indians are more insulin resistant. Then came Yajnik study. Yajnik said, let me look at it in children who are newborn. So this is the newborn child, born in Pune, small baby, underweight, okay, and smaller in size, weight is smaller, and this is the normal sized baby born in the UK in Southampton. Now when you have a bigger child like that, who do you think will have higher insulin level? You'll think the UK child will have the higher insulin level. Look at the insulin level shown here. In the Pune child, it is 55 picomoles per liter, in the London child, it is 13, almost three times, four times higher. The small baby from India, just born from the cord blood you've taken, insulin level is three times higher in that baby, in spite of being so small. Then what we did was, what he did was, he looked at leptin level. Now leptin is a good marker of obesity. He looked at leptin level and he found a 10 in the small Indian baby, it was four in the white baby, which is much bigger. When I mean, you have much bigger, you'll think you'll have more leptin. Actually, half the amount of leptin. So that is how he coined this thin, fat Indian baby, where there is insulin resistance at birth, on the day of birth. And he then, of course, went on with a B12. He said B12 is the reason for this, and it's one of the mechanisms. I don't believe that completely, because B12 is one of the contributing factors, but he believes that's the only factor. There, there are other factors as well. But what we showed in adults, he showed exactly the same thing on the day of birth, okay? Then I was very lucky when I got in touch with Sheila Maggie from uh, Johns Hopkins. It was only about two, three weeks before uh, this uh, Kelly West. I was uh, talking to her. I had a Zoom call with her. And she said, you know, Mohan, I've got same data in adolescents, children. 15, 16 years old, I've got white, I've got black, and I've got Indians. And I'm sh seeing higher insulin levels and insulin resistance in Indians. She said, only thing is, I've not published it, and I'm going to present it in ADA. When I checked, her presentation was on 21st, and mine was on 23rd. I said, Sheila, you presented on 21st. I'll come for your talk. And then you give me your slide, I'll show it on 23rd in my oration. So she gave me, very kindly she gave it to me. She was there in the audience, she's publishing it now. Look at the insulin secretion. These are non-diabetic children, young adolescents, okay, teenagers. This is whites, insulin. This is African-American, look at the Indian, higher. So Yajnika showed it at birth. She's showing it in childhood, and I showed it in adults, okay? And if you look at insulin sensitivity, again measured, the same thing which I showed you. This is the whites, this is the blacks, look at that there, they're highly insulin resistant. So these children were normal, normal Indians. They're not yet, they're not yet become fat, they're not yet developed diabetes, but they're already having insulin resistance. So there's something about the South Asian thing which needs to be studied. Uh, doctor, I showed another slide of uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep Mathur from Jaipur, who has done careful uh, MRAs. And he has shown a nice theory that the fat actually starts in the subcutaneous tissue, then moves into the visceral fat, but ultimately is a liver fat. 
That is his uh, conclusion from that uh, study. And the same thing was confirmed by a huge group of people, including Alka Kanaya and uh, many are Jason Kill and Navid Sattar. They put all the studies on South Asians together and looked at the fat. Where is this fat coming in South Asians? And they concluded that it's in the liver. So the liver seems to be the problem where in South Asians, this fat quickly moves around, gets into the liver, and it starts producing insulin resistance from there. Okay, and that's why your NAFLD and all that is very high. So the fifth lesson that I would like to teach you is that South Asians or Indians have greater insulin resistance at earlier stages in the natural history of type 2 diabetes compared to white Europeans, and this is driven mainly by ectopic liver fat. But at different times you measure, you'll find visceral fat also being more, and subcutaneous fat being more, but the main problem ultimately seems to be in the liver. Now, we said, okay, if this is true, then in a cross-sectional study, you should be able to show the decreased insulin secretion. As part of our DCLIP study, a large prevention trial that we are doing, we screened 26,000 people in Chennai by going to their homes and doing OGTT in their homes. We did fasting, 30-minute GTT, and a two-hour value. And along with that, we did insulin also in all the 26,000 people. Now, when we did, we first of all, we excluded those who had diabetes. If you had diabetes, you're out. You don't come in. Those who said we don't have diabetes, we did OGTT. Now, by calculating the fasting value and the 30-minute value of glucose and insulin, you can calculate what's called as the insulin disposition index. It's a nice index of insulin secretion. Of course, from the HOMA, you can also measure the insulin resistance. So the HOMA is shown here in red, and what's shown in yellow is the disposition index, how much insulin you're secreting. Now, when you go and do an OGTT like that in 26,000 people, some will have normal glucose tolerance, some will have pre-diabetes, and some will have diabetes also. It'll pick up, okay? So here are the normal glucose tolerant people. This is IFG, impaired fasting glucose. This is IGT, impaired glucose tolerant. This is combined IFG, IGT, and this is newly diagnosed diabetes. Look at the insulin level going down. So by the time you develop pre-diabetes, already your insulin has gone down, and by the time you have IGT plus IFG, is 50% already gone, and newly diagnosed diabetes, almost 80% of the beta cell function is gone. So you're losing beta cell function very rapidly. So this hyperinsulinemia that you're having is not lasting long. The body is not able to keep up with it. And you're, it's like having less of water in a well, and then you keep on putting a big bore well or something, and then taking a pump and take out everything, the water will go. Similarly like that, we seem to be losing beta cell function. That means if you really have to prevent diabetes in our people, we have to find some method of preserving beta cell function. Otherwise, this diabetes epidemic can never be stopped. This was beautifully summarized by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Venkat Narayan, in his 2015 Kelly West lecture. So he, what he did was he took two people who had very high rates of diabetes, two Indians. That's what he called as the tale of the two Indians, he called it. And we wrote this paper together. So the two Indians are Pima Indians and Asian Indians. What is the difference between the two? By age 50, 50% 50 will develop diabetes in Pima Indian, 50% will develop diabetes if you live in Chennai or Delhi at least, okay? But then the differences start from there. The Pima Indians are highly obese. The mean BMI is about 34. Whereas in Chennai, our people have a BMI of about 25. So almost eight difference in BMI. So one is thin and one is very obese. Pima Indians, from all the studies that we have shown, they are highly insulin resistant, whereas the Asian Indians seem to be highly insulin deficient. So we know that insulin deficiency and insulin resistance are the two aspects of type 2 diabetes. In one, the Pima Indians, insulin resistance predominates, whereas in the Asian Indians, insulin deficiency predominates, but both have very high rates of diabetes. Now you've got a case control kind of a thing. If you want to do comparative studies, you've got two different populations, which is what we are doing now in our current studies. So the lesson number six is that South Asians with type 2 diabetes have much more severe insulin deficiency than other ethnicities. Now that brings us to, is all type 2 diabetes the same, or are there different subtypes? Now, when Leaf Group and Emma Alquist from Sweden published this paper in around 2018 in the, in the Lancet Diabetes, 
This is the first time. We all know that type 2 diabetes is not the same. Some are thin, some are fat, some are old, some are young. We know all that. But nobody had classified it in a proper manner until these people had classified. And they said there's a very severe deficient form, there's a resistant form, an age-related form. So they had all that. Immediate question we asked is, can this be applied to South Asians? Why? Not because we want to do Me Too research. Because we know that 13 different differences I've already told you between Indians and things. So you don't expect it to be the same as in Europeans. So we did that. First what we did was we took the same criteria, same variables that they used, and tried it in our population. Didn't work at all. Again and again we tried, it didn't work at all. Then we found out, okay, the most important thing is a low HDL and the triglyceride. That has been left out by them. They didn't add the lipids. Let's add that and see. The moment we added, everything became okay. Our four results, four types of diabetes came out. And that's what we published uh, in this paper. Again, this was led by Anjana, but we had our colleagues in uh, Dundee, Ivan Pearson and Colin Palmer, Moniza and others. So this is what we found. There is a severe insulin deficient form of diabetes. These are the thin, young people, low BMI, low insulin secretion. Opposite is the fat people. It's not that in India we don't have obese people. Of course we have a lot of obese people. So that's the extreme of obesity. Then, to our surprise, we discovered a new form of diabetes in South Asians, described for the first time in South Asia, the combined insulin resistant and deficient diabetes. We're very happy we found this because it had never been described earlier. It is only seen in South Asians and they have the lowest HDL. Um, all of them have low HDL. All Indians have low HDL. Within that, they have the lowest HDL and the highest triglyceride. Just to give you an idea, if the triglyceride is about 180 here, here and there, it is 350 and above there. It's double, not just slightly higher. It is double. So by looking at the triglyceride itself, you can say which is the CARDD variety. Nobody else has such high dyslipidemia. And therefore, they are more prone to retinopathy, nephropathy, heart disease and so on. So this is a very unique form of diabetes that we see. And the age-related one is 65 years and above in Sweden. It is 52 years in India. What you talk about age-related diabetes is 52 years in India. There's no, diff there's no comparison at all from the white European and us. And if you add this and this, almost 40% are insulin deficient. So lesson number seven is that subtypes of type 2 diabetes in South Asians are there, but they seem to be different with insulin deficiency being the predominant finding and this combined insulin resistant and deficient type of diabetes, which incidentally was replicated, I showed that in Kelly West, it was replicated in the UK and the Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. I, I'm not showing it here now. Now coming to the last part, what about pre-diabetes? If diabetes is so different, what about pre-diabetes? Just uh, a few months ago, this major paper, the largest paper published on pre-diabetes in the world by uh, Mary Rooney and others, they looked at every published paper in the world on pre-diabetes, divided it according to different regions of the world, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Southeast Asia, and so on. And for the first time, no other paper had done that, reported on IFG separately, impaired fasting glucose separately, and IGT separately. The results were remarkable. If you look at IGT, these are all the world parts of the world. The lowest IGT is in Southeast Asia. And South Asia also, I'll, I'll show you Indian data, okay? So the lowest IGT in the whole world is in our place, in Southeast Asia and Southeast, uh, and South Asia. What about IFG? Highest is in Southeast Asia. So exact ulta. If you take IFG, we have the highest. If you take IGT, we have the lowest, okay? And North America and all come much higher than that. So when this was published, of course, they didn't know the significance of this. They just published it. So we, and by the time this was published, by the time Indiab came, this paper came out. So India was not included. So I immediately wrote to Diabetes Care and they said, I, I told the editor, India is left out, you publish that. So he said, you send it, I'll publish it. So in India, also the data is now there. IFG is 10%. IGT is 3%. So our data is similar.
similar to what Southeast Asia is showing. So South Asia and Southeast Asia have the highest IFG and the lowest IGT. Okay. You may say, why do you bother about all this? Does it make a difference between IFG and IGT? Unfortunately, yes. And that's why we are making a big deal out of it. Okay. With respect to prevention of diabetes, it makes a huge difference. Now, the four big studies on prevention are very well known. All of you know. DPP study from US, DPS from Finland, the Daching study from China, and Dr. Ramchandran's Indian Diabetes Prevention Program. These are the four largest prevention trials in the world. In India also, we had that large prevention trial. But guess what? All four had included only IGT. They left off IFG. They completely forgot about IFG. All the four studies, everything we talk about prevention, 58% prevention, all that we keep talking about is in IGT. So we realized this. So we said they have left out IFG. Let's now include IFG. So we took up what is called as a D-clip trial. I'll show it to you in a minute. And that was followed by the Kerala DPP trial. And then one more from UK by Melanie Davis. And the last one was from Japan. So there are only four studies now in the world which have included IFG. And D-clip was the first one. So D-clip again was in collaboration with Dr. Venkat Narayan, Mary Beth and uh, Lisa Steme and Ranjini from our group. Uh, we collaborated and did. D-clip stands for Diabetes Community Lifestyle Improvement Program. It's a diet and exercise program for prevention. But we added metformin also. All other drugs, they had metformin as separate arm. Here we said if lifestyle doesn't improve, then we'll add metformin. So that is the difference between D-clip and other. And of course, we included IFG as well. Now look at the results. What percentage of people could be prevented from developing diabetes? In Ramchandran's uh, uh, study, it was about 34, 36%. We got the same if you used IGT, okay? 31% reduction in development of diabetes. If you have IGT plus IFG, 36% reduction. But look at IFG alone. If you have IFG alone, despite diet, despite exercise, despite some weight loss, and despite adding metformin, only 12% of people could be prevented from developing diabetes. This is the first time in the world that such a statement had ever been made. That in, it was the first time in the world that IFG had been included. So when we published this, people are shocked. You mean you cannot prevent IFG? No, you cannot. They are progressing to diabetes, despite all that we know about prevention. So when you talk about prevention, prevention, as if it is so easy to do, you must specify that in IGT you can prevent, in IFG you cannot prevent. This is what we learned. And then, of course, the other three studies also were published. So then with uh, Jonathan Shaw and uh, uh, Satish Srinavakar, who now works at Emory with us, so we all joined uh, together, all the four authors joined together of the four studies. Jonathan Shaw, Brian Oldfield, uh, Anjana, and all of us joined together, Kamlesh Kunti, Venkat Narayan, and we said, let's write this paper. So we wrote this paper in Diabetes Care, which was chosen as the best article of that series. And they, in fact, made this drawing. And what it shows is our four studies. That's our study. This is Kerala study, and then Melanie Davis study, and the Japanese study. Now, what they're showing here is very interesting. If you look at IGT and combined IGT-IFG, the hazards ratio is 0.65 for IGT. What does it mean? 35% you can reduce diabetes. Very similar to what we showed. Look at IGT plus IFG, it's even better. 51, 0.51, 49% you can prevent diabetes if you have IGT plus IFG. Look at IFG alone, we said 12%. But when you add the four studies together, it is 0.97, 3%. Only 3% reduction in IFG. That means you cannot prevent IFG just with diet exercise. You need something else. What that something else is, we've written a big grant. I hope we get it. And if we get it, uh, we will know how to prevent. Till now, we don't know how to prevent IFG. That's the state of affairs. I put this together. I'm not going to go through that. We try to look at the mechanism. Why is IFG and IGT so different? In a nutshell, the problem with IFG is the problem is in the liver. I already told you in the beginning, Indians have in the liver hepatic fat, ectopic fat, more in the liver. They're bringing out insulin resistance. Soon they're burning out. They're pretty back to the liver. Okay? So that's where the problem is. In IGT, it's in the muscle. It's in the peripheral. It's your 
glucose disposition which is affected. Here it's a hepatic glucose production, which is why your IFG is high, because your fasting goes up, your sugar goes up, because the liver is producing more glucose. That we have found out now, okay? And there are many other things there which have written this in an article recently also, which I'm not going to go into. So lesson number nine is that it's more difficult to prevent diabetes in those with IFG. Now coming to the last question, is this genetic or is it environmental, okay? The first temptation is to say it's genetic, all genetic, we're all born with it because Yajnik showed it at birth also. Although he says it is intrauterine, it's because a mother is not getting enough B12, not getting enough nutrition, it is due to that. He may be right, we don't know. Now, to do that, you do huge studies, okay? GVAS, genome-wide association study. I've done three genome-wide association studies. All the three have been published. Here are two which are uh, published. One is with John Chambers, our collaborator, and Jaspal Kuna. We identified six genes which are associated with type 2 diabetes only in South Asians. And here the South Asians includes Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and Indians. Studied in India, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Singapore, and so on. But we had comparative group of Chinese, we had Japanese, we had white population, and the sample size is some 100,000 people. Huge study. It crossed more than 100 crores to do a study like that. Okay? And what we found was that these six genes are only associated with type 2 diabetes in South Asians, not in anybody else. You'll say, ah, oh, no, you solved it now, you know. No, there's a catch there. What these genes actually contribute is very, very small, half percent, one percent of all diabetes. If you add all the six, not even 10 percent. So 90 percent, it's not due to this. Then one more gene we uh, discovered uh, with uh, Nikhil Tandon and uh, Dwaipan Bharadwaj, we collaborated in one more. This is called the TMEM gene. One more gene. Again, very small. Then there's a uh, Sikh population that we uh, studied, uh, Punjabi Sikhs. Again, we found something very small. These are not explaining the big differences that we are seeing. They're all contributing, but not enough. So then you have to do more detailed uh, genetic work, which we are doing now. And this is one such example with Munisa Siddiqui and our group with the Dundee group. Here what we do is we take partition polygenic scores. So not just one gene, two genes, 100 genes we take for type 2 diabetes. And are they different between white Europeans and South Asians? And can they explain beta cell dysfunction? The advantage of such studies is you can study the insulin resistance separately, the beta cell function separately, age-wise separately, ethnicity separately. And what is shown in this very interesting paper we recently published was this is the genetics of this beta cell dysfunction in the white European population and this is in the South Asians. You can see that they are dividing. There's a little bit of overlap, but they're actually dividing. And that actually explains a lower insulin secretion. So we are able to show that there is a genetic contribution to this. We have made inroads into that. Now we're doing more detailed studies. We're studying epigenetics now to try to understand that. But I also mentioned that it was after 1991 that suddenly it increased. What happened? All our genes in 1991, uh, when Manmohan Singh opened up the economy, all our genes changed. It didn't change. What started changing was the, our lifestyle, okay? And that leads to a completely different kind of lifestyle in the 1960s and 70s. People carrying loads on their head, agriculturists working, and from there suddenly to mobile phones, to this, to fast foods, to junk foods, to, there's a complete change to an IT revolution, uh, our youngsters sitting and working to U.S. timings, whole night not sleeping, the sleep gone, circadian rhythm gone, completely changed. The lifestyle completely changes. Now, how to measure all this? You can measure it in a few ways. The first is carbohydrate and calories suddenly going up, okay? Number two, physical activity going down. Everybody is now buying vehicle and motorized transport. These are all signs of affluence, which is good. But then it also promotes diabetes. And last one is air pollution. Very briefly to finish off, the carbohydrate theory. How do you know that carbohydrates are linked to that? Everybody eats carbohydrate in India. But then, even if you take a city like Chennai, you can divide that carbohydrate into first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, fourth quartile. This first quartile itself is much more than what Europeans take. But within that, if you divide it into 
those who take, say, 100 to 200 grams of carbohydrate and 400 grams of carbohydrate, the diabetes goes up four times, four times. If it is 8% here, it is 32% there, diabetes, okay? And this is true for carbohydrate, for glycemic load, glycemic index. Look at dietary fiber, more fiber you take, less diabetes. These are very big cross-sectional studies from the CURE study, very powerful data. And it's been adjusted for all the other uh, covariates or confounders. But still, a cross-sectional study is a cross-sectional study. There are confounders which you cannot adjust for. So you, what you need is a prospective study. You have to start, first of all, you have to get the diet of the population, then follow them up for 15 years, see who develops diabetes, and then go back to the diet and say what were they eating and who developed diabetes. That is a longitudinal study. Very difficult to do, but we are lucky that we are able to do it. And uh, this is the pure uh, study uh, where we looked at rice intake in 21 countries, 132,000 people followed for 15 years. Uh, the study is led by Salim Youssef from, uh, from uh, McMaster University, Canada. And what we showed in the study was that higher consumption of white rice associated increased incident diabetes, new onset. People who did not have diabetes, they developed it over 15 years, and the strongest association was in South Asia where the maximum rice was eaten. Where rice was not eaten, the correlation was, was very weak. There's a very powerful study showing a link between rice intake. Rice can be replaced with wheat in the north and west. We just studied rice as one thing. L look at total carbohydrate, it comes to the same. Okay. Now, if you know all that, can you prevent the diabetes? So Anjana, along with the mathematician, a, a scientist, a statistician, and our head of nutrition, we've spent a couple of years on this, trying to say how much carbohydrate, very easy to say a direct trial, 600 calories, starve people, rest of their life have one milkshake uh, with uh, 200 calories, that will be your uh, food for the next 20 years. Nobody is going to follow that. So what we tried was various mathematical modeling. How much carbohydrate do you have to reduce? Turns out very simple. 10% if you reduce your carbohydrate from 60 to 70 to about 50%. Replace it with protein. Good quality protein, preferably vegetable protein. Even animal protein is okay unless it's not, if it's not red meat. Fish and chicken is okay. Egg is fine. And then keep the fat same but take MUFA and PUFA instead of your saturated fat, and increase the dietary fiber. I showed you all those in earlier slides. This is what the formula comes out. In all India level, if all of us tell whoever we know to cut down the carbs, follow the healthy plate, add more protein and more fiber, you will find diabetes coming down in the next few years. Okay? And the last thing I wanted to show you was that there are emerging new causes of type 2 Diabetes. This is a study uh, which we did as part of the CAR study, and this is led by Dwaraj Prabhakaran uh, along with uh, Nikhil Tandon and again Venkat Narayan and his group, where we looked at Delhi and Chennai, looked at pollution. And does pollution lead to new onset diabetes? Again, not cross sectional. New onset. What is the pollution rate? The most polluted areas, how many people got diabetes? Least polluted areas, where how many got diabetes? And we clearly showed that just pollution, particle 2.5, PM 2.5, is linked to new onset diabetes. This is bad news, but it's also good news. Because if you can prevent that pollution, a lot of the diabetes, and it's not that difficult to cut down on pollution. And that's what, so we wrote this editorial recently in JAPI, saying it's a new cause of type 2 diabetes. So this is my final slide, that what all we have learned over the last 50 years of work in epidemiology of diabetes in South Asians is that there is a phenotype. Definitely there is a phenotype. Nobody will deny that now. This seems to be present from birth, as Yajnik showed. Continues through childhood and adolescence. The stage one is where you have hyperinsulinemia. The body is trying to put out more and more insulin to keep your glucose level normal. With that, what happens is fat starts accumulating because of the carb load that we take and the high fat also that we ate. The fat then overflows goes into the liver, sits there, produces ectopic fat. This results in insulin resistance, IFG first, then IGT, then uh, to type 2 diabetes. Beta cell function is now compromised because you're putting out more and more insulin, body cannot have, handle it. Maybe you have a genetic defect already, 
and very quickly we lead to exhaustion of beta cells, leads to severe insulin deficiency and to the type 2 diabetes. So when you talk of the causes, there are ethnic causes that, and then the unhealthy fats, we eat a lot of unhealthy fat, there's no fiber, we don't do enough exercise, not enough protein. And now we are adding the new risk factors like air pollution. So if you want to find solutions, start with improving the nutrition in the mother. Even before she gets pregnant, start pre-pregnancy, intrauterine, improve the nutrition, make the child healthier. Then from childhood itself, start modifying the diet. From age five, we have data to show that already this phenotype is kicking in. You'll find the HDL already going down, fat already accumulating. There is a new study which came out. They studied children in India and found 30% having fatty liver. Children, 12-year-old children having fatty liver. Okay? So already it is starting. We have to start even before that. Decrease the carbs, increase the protein, healthy fats, increase fiber, increase exercise, and decrease pollution. If you do that, I think we can prevent diabetes in South Asians. It's up to you all, youngsters in the audience, to take this up, to take it up to the next 20 years or so into translational research. We have learned all this. Now we have to translate it in every state that you work in. Work on these principles. They're not difficult. Forget about the genetics. We won't change it. But these are enough, I think, to prevent diabetes. I'd like to end by thanking my extended family. Of course, all my collaborators whom I have named in various countries, in US, in UK, in Canada, Australia, and many other places. But also my whole team at uh, MDRF. I'm blessed to have so many scientists with different fields, whether genomics or nutrition, epidemiology, ophthalmology, cell and molecular biology, a whole team of people who have been working for more than 20 to 30 years to try to understand the South Asian phenotype, apart from, of course, all the other doctors and so on. Big thank you to my daughter and son-in-law who are there, and even before that, uh, to my late wife who started this whole process. I salute them and I thank you for your patient hearing. I'd like to end by saying that uh, in July we have our update. I know many of you already participate in this. This is an open invitation to all of you to attend that because many more such talks will be given. We have some of the brightest faculty from all over the world coming to uh, for this year and I invite you to attend the update. And on that note, I'd like to thank you once again paying my pranams to Dr. Lily John, uh, but for whom this oration would not have been there, and to Disha, to all the three chairpersons, and to all of you for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Since it is an oration, there are no questions. And one round of applause to all the audience also.